Today we'll be taking a look at how Swampert will do in my second optimized Emerald solo challenge and I have to say this is a pretty fun process. I started out with Rayquaza last time just to get a really good feel for the game and learn everything and since that Pokemon is the closer for the speed run, it just feels really fitting to use the other Pokemon that just carries the majority of that run, so I just had really high hopes initially. I don't really have too much to say about the stats, they're pretty good, that's my analysis, but the 60 base speed is about the only thing that's not to love. and ultimately it's just not gonna matter too much and the level up learn set's also pretty forgettable for my money i think mud shot is the only standout move that's gonna get any sort of use and when you look at the tm learn set this is about where everything good's gonna come from surf and earthquake top of the bunch you already know but things like brick break rock tomb they also have some pretty good niche uses and i would say for me ice beam is the standout move and that's because of swampert's topping and for me that's the polarizing part of this pokemon I think water and ground as a top combination, it has so much potential and it could just run over this game, but already early in this video, I'm gonna put a quick little focus on the Achilles heel for this run, and it's that juicy double weakness to grass. The funny thing about this game is that there are actually, if you look at the totality of it, there are barely any spots where grass tops are even a true threat, but there are a handful of spots in the game and it feels like it almost strategically sprinkles them in and it always keeps you honest and it always forces you to plan around them. But I want you to think about that, put it in your back pocket for now, we'll come back to it, we'll build up to it, and let's just talk about the start of the run. So today, bare minimum, I'm only finding the one mandatory trainer and we're gonna find ourselves straight into Rustboro. And I'm gonna make a straight line to the gym where I'm gonna be battling each of Roxanne's gym trainers and that's ultimately just gonna take us straight to the first gym battle. There's no need for theatrics today. Roxanne's first two Pokemon are double weak to water and they are just a blip on the radar and Nosepass isn't too much harder. Now I will say that if you did this battle at minimum, it's still winnable, but it's just not guaranteed. Rock Tomb does have that speed drop combined with maybe Nosepass's Orenberry and Roxanne does have a little stash of potions. That means you can be stalled out, but the benefit of needing some levels later in the run do make this a pretty quick first gym badge. During the next segment where you rescue Pico, I'm going to pick up another optional battle with Buckcatcher Jose. And as I take that nice little boat ride down to Duford, the significance of that battle is that it pushes me to level 16 and I'm going to get Mudshot. And I'll talk more about that move and Rock Tomb that I learned from Roxanne in a bit, but 55 base power on a ground move, it will let us take on Brawly now. Now I know I name dropped the speed run probably a little bit too much, but you skip Brawly in that run and originally I was going to keep things to the minimum and I was going to skip it too, but circumstances that have came up during the routing process, it dictates that I need to take him on here and now. Now this battle is not perfect, nor is it guaranteed. Now the strategy is to just brute force your way through it with Mudshot and it works great usually, especially on the first two Pokemon. Now Makuhita with the potion backup along with the Citrus Berry can be a nuisance. Now it's kind of like Nosepass. He can just outlast you if you don't pay attention to health ranges and just don't forget he has bulk up, which will make your Mudshots do less damage. And I just I ultimately get the crit here and it helps out. Now you also can't use Mud Slap to lower accuracy and just kind of cheese your way through the fight because he has vital throw and it's just going to bypass accuracy checks. But like all things, with enough persistence you can get through the battle and pretty quick second badge all things considered. Now I think this is a good time to talk about why it was necessary to route in Brawly when I previously wasn't, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it guys. It was because of the second mandatory rival fight. Now this is the first part of the game where grass moves are going to be an actual threat, and the whole first part of this run really revolves around this fight. I needed extra levels, and in my opinion I think it's pretty dumb to fight just random trainers rather than doing things like fighting Brawly to get the same experience, but I am ultimately to where I want to be going into the that moment. Now let me touch on some things leading up to the battle. Now first is by nature. We are lonely today, it increases attack, lowers defense, and that choice was mainly for this one battle. Second, and I need to preamble some of this stuff before we get into the battle, is that both Rock Tomb and Mudshot have a guaranteed one stage speed drop on your opponents. It's something that you really don't think about a ton, but in my opinion, 
I think the speed drops from those moves, it's one of the MVPs of the run, it has to be. The combination of these things allowed me to only be a lowly little level 20 for this rival battle in the final optimized run, and I really just want to shed some light, maybe give you some insight on the fight, and the main takeaway here is that this fight is awful. Now at first, I could not fathom making this fight consistent even at like level 23, and I think I tried pretty much everything in the book that was available to me. I tried doing the incredibly slow trick room section, I tried using early candies, and this one initially was like a really big head scratcher, but I don't want to go on and on about it. I think we should actually just dive in and talk about the battle. Slugma is up first, it doesn't really matter, Slugma balls. Now the problem with Grovile, and we're going to do a freeze frame here, and if you're wondering, Grovile, I looked up the pronunciation, that's the best you're going to get. Now there's two things to note here that made this fight infuriating in practice, and number one, Grovile is incredibly fast, it allows it to hit hard, and most importantly, hit first. Number two is that Absorb is normally a pretty forgettable move, only has 20 base power, but we're double weak to grass, so that means it's 80 effective power, it's a new nuke that more importantly heals 50% of the damage dealt. Now this puts you in an awful position where you're already fighting an uphill battle, but now you have limited time, you can barely tank any hits, and you'll likely never outpace the healing. So I want to break this down for you. Grovile will go first, it's going to hit incredibly hard, but since it's the opening move, here's the an important thing here, the heal is irrelevant. Now I'm going to fire off a Rock Tomb. With Lonely Nature and level 20 damage rounding threshold, it does over 50% of its health. That's Great, but here's the key. The speed drop is absolutely crucial here. I want you to look at the bottom. The little purple circle will denote its speed, and with the one stage speed drop, we are now faster. That means I essentially get two turns in a row, and since Rock Tomb already did over 50%, it's only a matter of just hitting the move, and that's pretty much the genius strat of this fight. Now, Wing Gold doesn't matter much. I can just Rock Tomb, but I did mention earlier, I said, hey, it's a matter of hitting the move, and that's because Rock Tomb only has 80% accuracy, so you can get unlucky here, but trust me when I say that this fight is where I spent the majority of my routing process, and here's the end result. Pretty clean win overall. Now I think we're going to jump directly into Watson, and normally this is kind of like a point of contention for every run and something that you would need to plan around, but it goes without saying that being a ground type that's immune to electric, it just, it does really great here. But the theme for Swamper is that the run is like really smooth outside of those weird little moments where grass moves are in play, and the rest of the game is a relatively easy stroll. Now I did pick up Soft Sand to boost my ground damage earlier before Slateport. I didn't really mention it, I think it was in the background of the footage, but a slight damage boost to the ground top moves. It helps out on more than one occasion, but before we pick up the pace, I think it's time to talk about our very, very first Emerald Split data. After three gems, Swampert holds a nearly eight minute lead over Rayquaza's run, and most of that is thanks to the, like, the smart way that I had found to get past that rival fight. But also remember that Rayquaza's rock sand split was incredibly slow. Counting the Pico section, Swampert did four total extra battles like as a whole, whereas Ray had to pick up like 12. So it goes without saying, if you're looking at this list, here's, here's how to break it down. Swampert levied a much better Roxanne and Watson type matchup into a big lead, which isn't too surprising but we will keep an eye on things. Remember, I just said Swampert doesn't really care about anything outside of those rare battles with grass damage, and now I'm really gonna start cruising through this section of the game, but there are a couple of things to note. The first is I'm gonna be getting secret power here. Now I could care less about this move and I'm not gonna be using it, but getting this move does unlock the ability to buy hidden power down in Slateport. That's pretty important. The second is that I'm gonna be getting Dig right after Fall Arbor. Now this move is incredibly weak compared to its Gen 1 glory days, but but it has one singular niche use for this run specifically. And the last thing that's going to carry over into later in the video is that I'm going to be actually picking up vitamins today. It starts right here. This protein is locked behind Rock Smash, but this protein is pivotal later in the run. You got to trust me on that. Now, after finally making that big loop around using Abra to get back to Mallville, it's time to look at that Mount Chimney section. I would say this part is pretty skippable, but I would just like to take a second to talk about Intimidate and I guess maybe Mightyena in general. There are just so many battles in Pokemon Emerald where this thing comes out first and just to add to it instantly neutering your attack stat with Intimidate and also throughout the game it has things like Sand Attack, it has things like Swagger that can make you confused and I think this is just a really frustrating Pokemon and this makes a battle like this with Maxi that should be 
really easy start to maybe stall out a little bit and I start to get pretty low and I guess the long and short of what I'm trying to say here is that Mariana is just really annoying and I guess that makes it a really effective lead Next up on the chopping block is Flannery. Fire types do have a special place in my nice little heart, but let's just, let's be real with ourselves. There's no doubt what Swampert's gonna do here. So let's just let this footage kind of finish out, get another badge, let's move on. Now I'm making my way towards Norman, and on the way I'm gonna buy Hidden Power. Now I'm gonna learn it along with Dig in preparation for this fight, because for my money, this was easily the hardest fight in the game that didn't involve grass damage. I'd also like to just quickly touch on Hidden Power in Gen 3 compared to Gen 2. A while ago I did a pretty lengthy Hidden Power rant in like a Scizor Crystal video, and the basics of it is how all Hidden Power types are not created equal, and that's mainly because of the limitations of the old DV system that only went up to 15. Now in Gen 3, DVs are replaced with IVs, they go up to 31, and I'm just going to get straight to the point here. This is a magical change regarding hidden power, because this little change lets you use virtually any hidden power type that you want, for whatever the situation might call for, and this is why in this run I'm going to use hidden power fighting. Now hidden power fighting specifically is laughably bad in Gen 2, and I just really want to put some emphasis here, because you can go hidden power fighting, ghost, or electric in these games, and you won't even notice the impact on your stats at all but in regards to Norman I'm gonna equip a Chesto Berry and let's just kind of break down the strategy for this one Hidden Power Fighting makes Spinda a one-shot, there's no need to really elaborate any further. And now let's kind of circle back to speed lowering moves like Mudshot because they come into play once again. You really just hope you don't get like a slash crit here, and if you drop Vigoros speed by one stage you're going to outspeed it, you're going to get back to back turns. And you will notice that Mudshot is a range so the fighting hidden power makes sure that it can't hang on, survive, get more damage off. For Lanoon, Mudshot is the strat once again, if it goes for Belly Drum it'll half its health and it's going to knock it out. It doesn't here. The worst case scenario happens, it adds some extra damage with facade, and I can eventually finish it off with another hidden power. Now at this point, you're low, Gen 3 AI is good, slacking knows it, and with the massive attack stat, it's going to go for facade and try to end the battle. It's nearly going to knock my head off, but the important thing here is that I barely survive because of the rest of the battle was pretty free. Now once again, Mudshot speed drops are the key, and it lets me control the fight as long as I know what turn slacking is on, and if you keep Keep that in mind, you really can't lose. Now you just sync up your turns with dig, and this battle is essentially over. You dig underground, slacking misses its move, you do your damage, and then it's gonna loaf around, and you just kinda rinse and repeat this process until you win. Now taking full advantage of slacking's awful ability along with hidden power fighting, it let me do this fight a lot earlier than I initially thought was possible, just like earlier in that rival battle, but this one is still pretty tricky. Now you're gonna notice me kinda pause for several seconds here, just because Norman used his potions and it made me pause for a second to wait and say hey is slacking gonna loaf around this turn or am I just gonna throw the battle but this was a fun one to figure out and it's likely the only time we'll ever see a use for dig and emerald runs After that is going to be the start of a few things that Swampert needs to do that Rayquaza didn't have to do. With access to Surf, I'm going to run a few errands, but the key here is that I'm going to Surf below Slateport and get some goodies. The first is a rare candy that's hidden on this rock, and the second is that I'm going to navigate to the abandoned ship, and ultimately I'm going to get Ice Beam. Now Ice Beam doesn't automatically mean that our grass troubles are over, but it does help with the ultimate goal, and plus it's a move that's just going to stick with us through the whole playthrough. Really solid move. I don't really need to tell you that. Now, skipping ahead, I do pick up four citrus berries for this run, and after we have a nice little run-in with our beloved Shelly and her perfect hair, we got another rival battle to talk about. a citrus berry equipped because I need every ounce of HP that I can possibly get but just like the first battle slugma doesn't really matter let's just get by it go to Grovile once again and do another freeze frame so just like last time we are outsped but instead of absorb razor leaf is now on the table I don't even want you guys to imagine what a razor leaf crit would do to our poor little swampy boy but what this all boils down to is that there's a 25% chance for razor leaf to crit which ultimately means we just have a 25% chance just to flat out lose the battle 
without getting to make a single input and we're just kind of at the mercy of the RNG gods here. Now Razor Leaf doesn't crit but just look at this damage. It takes me from full health all the way down to just 4 HP but don't panic because we got this. For like the fourth time in the run Mudshot speed drop is clutch because just like last time it now means that I'm going to outspeed and we got our new little toy that we just picked up in Ice Beam. It's going to finish the job. Now the Citrus Berry is key here because it gives us like a little health buffer because being clever with speed drops can only take you so far and if you're just barely hanging on the Pelipper will just take you out. And that little Citrus Berry is just a little cherry on top to finish off the battle even though if Pelipper had its way it would use Protect every single turn. With this battle complete, there's really nothing that stands in the way of Swampert for a very long time, so we can just kind of blitz our way through a couple of errands and ultimately get to the sixth gym. Now this part of the game is Rare Candy Central. It gives you a whopping four candies almost back to back to back to back, because remember, when you're doing the Abra route, you're gonna go all the way down, pick up the Lily Cove flight path, then do Mount Pyre first. But before I dive into the gym, I do want to clarify something. Back when I had to delay the Rayquaza video for a week because of some editing problems and all that, I just, I'll be honest with you, I just wanted to play Emerald more because I was having so much fun. So I took a break and I did the entire Swampert playthrough over the weekend and I decided to do the voiceover. Uh, and so this was like before the Rayquaza video was even fully edited. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that I have no idea if my overall rule set had any criticisms or ideas. And this means that doing this run, I'm still gonna be using Tropius for my double battles, which means that I decided it was ultimately okay to use Tropius for the Tate and Liza battle. So if anyone had some like really insightful comment about this sort of thing I'm really sorry because the first Emerald video literally hasn't been fully edited yet as the time of me speaking these words and I also I know that I'm not gonna fully edit this video until I do like another gen 1 video or two and that just makes this even more confusing but it is what it is I just wanted to play more Emerald and that turned into me doing the voiceover real quick because the run was still fresh in my mind that I wanted to get some good thoughts in on it but the whole TLDR here before I talk too much is that I don't want anyone to think that maybe I ignored that constructive criticism or anything like that from the last video. I simply just played this run in parallel with the Rayquaza video, but this one just kind of hung in limbo for about a month due to me kind of underestimating just how much work the full swap to GBA content would actually be, but I digress. Let's get straight into Winona. There's not really much to say here. I'll rehash some concepts I said last time. I think it's interesting that Winona has like the more interesting flying type combinations. You got Altaria, which is neutral to electric. You got Pelipper and Skarmory, which are neutral to ice moves. So you really can't just focus in on one damage type. And this one's what it boils down to is that ice beam is still pretty great. And since we do have a really strong stab serve, you can just use it on something like Skarmory. Makes this one pretty comfortable overall. Not really much to talk about. Coming up next is the time of the game where there's just a ton of busy work. We'll start by looking at the Magma Hideout. The only thing that I change up from last time is that I actually get the PP max here because I use Surf a ton and I just really want to max my PP. Who wouldn't want to do that? I'm going to look at Maxi as well. Mightyena is just a menace. Now it and the Crobat are just fast and I take a lot of hits and it's really not a comfortable battle. Also, think about this. I'm in the medium slow leveling group, which is among the best in the game, the fastest leveling in the game. And the fact that two thirds of Maxi's team out level me, it just says a lot. And it's something that I've just really grown to like about Emerald. I'm also gonna backtrack in the hideout after the battle to get a decently slow rare candy that I didn't get with Rayquaza. So I wanted to point that out. And then when we look over at the Aqua segment, it's even less interesting. Now there's another map versus map face off, pretty exciting stuff but since you don't actually fight the aqua leader just yet it's a lower level it's a lot easier now we got to start thinking about tate and liza now remember this is without any feedback and after some reflection i would rather just use tropius here and let me just talk about that now if you're putting yourself in a situation where your meryl will die instantly your level four meryl it's simply just not a fun challenge to be in basically a 1v4 situation where buffs like light screen reflect and a plethora of other things can be used and for my dnd &D fans out there, anyone who gets double the turn economy will ultimately prevail. There's not really any counterplay on the other side, so it just doesn't feel great. And I think if you force yourself to use like a single low level HM Pokemon, your only solution in this fight in pretty much every run is going to be to always use Hidden Power Ghost and to always pretty much use all of your candies here because it's the only way you'll get by this fight. Now what 
I love about these runs are things that we've already seen earlier. Using my tools to get past things like the two rival battles, or maybe Norman to avoid extra level ups with Dig. It felt fun, it felt awarding, but I think on a forced double battle like this, it crosses over into that realm of tedium. Now at the end of the day, Tropius can maybe last an extra turn, maybe it can get off something like a fly and last even longer, but ultimately that just doesn't really mean much in the grand scheme of things, but I think it's an interesting discussion that I promise I'm done talking about, but like I said earlier, some of you are really insightful, so I am interested to hear some feedback whether what I just said made sense or not. So with all that said, Tate and Liza, they still demand a lot of candy usage, especially since I'm not using the ghost type hidden power. So I am going to use seven of my nine rare candies. I'm going to get up to level 48. I'm going to equip a citrus berry and let's just get to work. So in this run, they love to focus Swampert from my experience, and I know Calm Mind setup is on Zatu's mind, so I'm gonna focus it first. So this does let the Tropius start to get flies off and hopefully avoid another turn or two. And what I just noticed from all these playthroughs is that she's gonna use stuff on Swampert, which if you think about it, it is the smart play. But once you get Zatu down, this is where Surf really, really shines. So in Gen 3, in a double battle, it's gonna hit both enemy Pokemon, and since every Pokemon Pokemon, when you get that Zatu down, is going to be weak to serve. It becomes the play to get out of this battle alive. Now, I do get chipped down enough to where I have to use the Citrus Berry, but what's funny here is that I did this really long, ranted, and in my opinion, justified Tropius rant. But the way I found that things usually go for this run is that Tropius will just be alive at the end and they'll just focus on Swampert. So he's just flying around, Swampert's just going through hell. And if you can just make it to that point to where Swampert can get on that surfboard and start slinging out some water, you will take home the seventh badge. And I feel like I've already said this a couple of times already, but between the 7th and 8th gym, it's chalked full of yet more busy work, but Swampert is going to pick up this candy right here that Ray once again had the luxury to skip. It is locked behind two trainers that all have one shottable Pokemon, so I do pick it up. And when we make it to the seafloor cavern, it goes without saying that Earthquake is a ginormous pickup. Now the Archie battle isn't too bad just because the Tate and Liza battle demanded so many candies, and at first, I didn't really like that Archie and Maxi have almost the same exact team outside of swapping a thematic third Pokemon, but the more I sat here and thought about it, the more it made sense to me. Now these are two people with two completely opposite goals, but underneath it all, they are still extremely similar, and I think that the game showing that by giving them extremely similar teams is just a nice touch. Or maybe I'm just looking into it too much and they just have the same team because originally Ruby and Sapphire made you only fight one of them, but I do like to give people more credit than they'd often deserve, so we'll just stick with the first thing. I'm also going to die on this hill here and say that this little swim from Seafloor Caverns to Pacific Log is by far the hardest thing in the entire game, but they always say that practice makes perfect, and I want you guys to look here at this little beautiful run that I had. Now seriously, I want you guys, if you don't know, boot up Emerald, make it to this spot, and try to swim to Pacific Log without getting caught once on a faster speed because it's brutal to not mess up at all. I'm also going to go ahead and pick up this rare candy to the west of Pacific Log, and remember last time I talked about that really good trainer, the pseudo rare candy with all the Gyaradoses. Now Swampert cannot do that battle fast, but I do want you guys to know that I really, really contemplated using Hidden Power Electric for access to that free experience as well as a few other spots in the game, but I decided that Norman was too inconsistent without Hidden Power fighting. After visiting Pseudopolis in the Sky Tower, I'm going to dip into Shoal Cave during the High Tide to get another rare candy that Rayquaza once again didn't have to get. And guys, I have to once again mention this ice puzzle before Juan because I genuinely just love it. And now let's just dive into the final gym. Ultimately, this is kind of anticlimactic. Now in this run, we've seen some close battles and all that kind of stuff, but this one kind of falls into the area where like Roxanne, Flannery, or Watson reside in. And I think a theme that you'll see in future videos is something that I've already talked about earlier. It's that the candy usage that Tate and Liza required, it just makes a lot of later fights a lot easier. The only thing that this fight has going for it is that Kingdra just loves to waste your time. It has rest, it has access to hyper potions, and it's really content just making the time on your playthrough increase while you just sit there and hope and pray that it just stops healing, but it's really not a challenge. The final gym goes down.
Now we can catch up on just a few more errands, and I will say that I think this is my first mistake. Probably the big mistake of the run. I pick up Brick Break. Now it's a very small incremental upgrade over Hidden Power Fighting, but I just don't think it was needed or worth the time. Now I think the act of going to get this move, learning it, and all that stuff just wasted a lot of precious time and if I were in a position where maybe I could sit down and do like 15 Swampert runs I would definitely cut this part out of the route but if you are someone out there looking to maybe have the world's best Swampert run there you go I would change that from there I'm gonna pick up the two candies that are locked behind waterfall and Swampert has just one more stop to make I'm gonna return to Slateport to buy vitamins now I know that you can buy them in the Lily Cove Mart but I think this is a faster location that's neither here nor there but I'm gonna get two proteins six calciums that's gonna be the magic number of vitamins to help me out during the final stretch of the game and I'll talk about the real significance of these vitamins when it's relevant but let's get to victory road so here let's take a final look at split data to get us caught up and you might be surprised to see that Swampert has maintained green splits across the board for the whole game it really peaked during that Flannery section and as Swampert slowly had to add in a few things that Rayquaza didn't have to do the lead did start to dwindle now remember Ray had a very slow start but really cruised through the game at a certain point but Swampert was kind of the opposite. Now, as it stands right now with the vitamin buy, only 55 seconds separate these two runs, which means that it's pretty much anyone's ball game. Also, before we jump in, I do hit 53 in Victory Road. I'm going to pop the rest of my candies. That's going to get me to level 60. And ultimately, that's going to set us up to take a look at the Elite Four. Sydney is first, and as annoying as Mightyena can be, it's the least of your worries. Being level 60 here helps with a lot of ranges, but the main focus of this fight is that there are two grass-type Pokemon on this dark-themed team, but fortunately, Ice Beam is a clean one-shot at this level. Now, this isn't what using my candies was for, or even what the vitamins were for, but it does give you a slight little speed increase. Swampert just mows everything down. We can be on our way. BB is yet another spot where the levels and the vitamins do help a little bit. Now what I loved about how all this worked out is that the ranges that Earthquake gives you, but opening on this Dusclops here, it's always annoying. Now sometimes it can do an early curse and that's pretty much an instant reset because you're never going to out damage it. But if you take care of business on that opening Pokemon, the rest pretty much just fall like dominoes and it's a pretty easy battle. Glacia is more of a mixed bag. Now on one hand, you can tell that I'm not too worried because I didn't even heal, but on the other hand, there are several pitfalls that make the decision not to heal kind of stupid. Now this one mainly comes down to ranges. They're pretty tight. Now there's a slight chance for the Glalies and the second Celio to barely survive at one HP like it does here, and things can start to get a little dicey. Now the second Celio survives, barely. It gets hell off, and by the time I make it to the wall run at the end, I'm chipped down and I'm in a pretty bad position. Now you can never really one shot the wall rain, so I just go for brick break And I was gonna say that I think if she went surf here She would have won but since it's a water ice top and surf and ice beam have the same power It really doesn't matter. She can't quite finish the job I just barely hang on and Swampert's undefeated streak remains intact for now I think Drake's the most straightforward fight in the entire game. You have to ask yourself one question. Do you have an ice move? We do, yes, ice beam. So we're pretty good here. Most of his Pokemon are double weak to ice. And I guess to talk about the battle, Shogun can annoy you with protect. And this is the battle where the highest speeds in the game can be found. And what this really just amounts to is that both Flygon and Salamence are gonna get off moves. I think you should be fine as long as you just heal to full before the fight, but we're gonna win this one pretty easy. And that's gonna leave us with just one battle left. Wallace is a nightmare because he has a grass type that is not weak to ice beam, but let's take it one step at a time. For Well Lord, Rain Dance on turn one is a death sentence, worst case scenario, but most of the time it's gonna do a little bit of damage to you. I like to soften it up with like ice beam or something like that, then use earthquake so it doesn't use a potion. It's not really that bad. Ludicolo is the problematic Pokemon, and in theory it shouldn't be too bad. At level 63, Lonely Nature, Soft Sand Equipped, and three total proteins, you have a little bit under 93 
100% to get the two shot with Earthquake. Now Ludicolo goes for double team, and since I'm healthy enough with this setup, everything's perfect. And I, I want you to soak in this information. There's only a 7% chance that this Ludicolo survives two Earthquakes. And what do you know? Hey, what do you know? Our luck is going to run out here, and it's actually going to survive, and it, the fight's going to stall a little bit, and it's just a matter of time before you get Giga Drained, and we're going to have our first reset. So on the second attempt, we're going to see yet another reset, and while the Whale Lord is out here, let me talk about Rain Dance and why it's so bad. It's because Ludicolo has Swift Swim. It's going to double its speed, so since it outspeeds you, it's going to make things extra difficult. But here, when we finally make it to Ludicolo, you're going to see that it's not going to use Double Team. It's actually going to use Leech Seed, and since this isn't Gen 1, Leech Seed will actually tick first, and it's going to take it just outside of Earthquake range, and you already know what's going to happen. Once you start getting Giga Drained, it's over with. That's the second reset. And I would just like to say, I think that I got unlucky during those attempts. I got this fight down to like almost a science. It's what everything was planned around, what all the vitamins were for. So if the Whale Lord doesn't Rain Dance, and it doesn't put you into Giga Drain range, things just really aren't that bad. Now, Water Spout here does a little bit more damage than I would like it to, and I'm not completely sure that I'm outside of that Giga Drain range, but the Pokey guys, they do me a solid here. And I'm actually gonna crit on Earthquake, and now we're in the driver's seat. Now from there, Tentacruel is an easy one shot. Whiskash can't really do a ton to you other than just stall out with full restores. But let me take this little quick time to talk about those vitamins. Now the proteins, the held items, all that stuff, they help with Ludicolo. But even if you make it past that point, Swampert has no real direct answers to Gyarados, and that's where those six calciums come into play. So without them, Ice Beam will be a four hit, and Earthquake and Hyper Beam from the Gyarados will likely just outpace you, meaning that you're efforts to get past the salsa dancing duck are in vain but this is one of the huge reasons i tried to see if i can make the change to hidden power electric but ultimately six calciums gives you about a 96 percent chance to three shot with ice beam and here i'm going to get a lucky crit which is going to make it a two shot now notice that gyarados sets up dragon dance and you can see just how much damage it starts to do but sometimes a little luck it never hurt anyone and at the end of the day all that's left is melodic you only need enough health here to survive just one move and even if you factor in the intent Intimidate from Gyarados or the fact that Melodic has a Citrus Berry, Earthquake can still get a two shot. Now I survived the Surf with just 20 HP. That means I can finish off the battle on the next turn and ultimately that's gonna end the run. Swampert finishes the run with a time of 3 hours, 1 minute and 55 seconds, and that's exactly 1 minute ahead of Rayquaza's time, and let's just give a couple of notes where I could maybe do better, but just simply don't have the real life time to do it. I think using rest in the final battle over Brick Break would give you some breathing room before the Gyarados, but ultimately I just couldn't cut out the vitamin buy, but I do think there's potential for like a sub 3 hour run if you played a little bit better and maybe cut out things like Brick Break. Now I'm not worried because likely we'll eventually circle back around to the these first runs when I start to improve on the game, but I think to beat Rayquaza was really impressive. I did four total runs here, mainly because I had to test out those rival battles so much, but I started out in like the three hour, 40 minute range, and then my second best run was like three hours and 20 minutes, so I thought this Pokemon was going to be really far behind the box art legendary, but I can't stress enough how much that level 20 rival fight, using the Rock Tomb strats, or using the Dig strats on Norman, or the speed drops on the Razor Leaf rival fight, how much those helped, and they just went so long and just shaving off huge chunks of time but i think my final thoughts is that i had a lot of fun with this one now speaking of fun special shout out to my channel members and patreons that show their support to the content it just means a lot and if you made it this far you're a real one and i'm probably going to regret doing this full commentary like a month before i edit the video it's going to be really confusing but it is what it is hope you enjoyed it and that's it for me i'll catch you on the next one bye